Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for being here present at this talk. Uh, my name is Javier Pimas. And actually, this is not going to be a talk, but there are going to be two talks in the same, for the same price, which is free. But okay. Um, uh, so, what I'm going to first uh, do, this is what I'm going to tell you, is uh, about. Uh, this thing which we call Powerlang um, and all the ideas behind it and then I'm going to uh, start the second talk, talk about a particular implementation of a small talk on top of Powerlang. So uh, how this all starts, right? Uh, I've been doing VM programming and small talk, uh, low level programming for already a decade, so it's a lot of time and I have learned quite a few things. And uh, I have many times the feeling that I was doing something that was already done and uh, that it was very costly to, to implement. So I started wondering, okay, well, what of all this work that I've been doing could be reused? What parts of it? could be reused in some way. And uh, so, well, um, for the uh, last years, I've been working on B, uh, B small talk uh, runtime uh, implementation. And I've been doing a, what uh, we call the dynamic uh, metacircular runtime, which is a small talk runtime that is completely implemented in small talk, right? And that took quite some work. And so just to give you an example, and uh, all this work is the same work that you need to create any programming language, probably, right? So what do you need to create a programming language? Well, of course, you are going to need to compile that language, right? So to be able to compile that language, you have to parse the text that makes the strings if it's going to be text-based, right? And in order to parse those strings, you are going to also need uh, to scan the, the characters there, the characters there, to see the tokens. You are going to need to define some kind of execution semantics, right? What is the computation being done on those languages? What type of computation? How do you define what is to execute something there? Right? So you have to define some execution semantics. It could be low-level instructions. You, it could be bytecodes. It could be more abstract things like what you see in Smalltalk with objects and messages. And then you may want to have some kind of uh, AST or something similar. Uh, you may need, if you are going to do everything as we did, you may need uh, also an assembler for generating native instructions for the processor. There are many things, and then if you're going to send messages, then, well, you're going to need lookup, you're going to need to implement primitives because your language is high level and the computer is not high level. High level algorithms for garbage collection, there's quite a lot of things to do, right? And that's even not the whole thing. You also need to be able to create that program. You will need to bootstrap it. OK, what does it mean? Well, OK, I have defined all the code that makes the kernel of my language. But now I have to compile it and generate an executable. Well, I have to put everything in a package. I have to put the initial objects there. And that requires quite some work, too. And then I'm also going to need to debug it, right? And even uh, if I'm, I don't have the complete language, I still have to debug it because I'm doing it, and I have to know whether what I'm doing is right or wrong, right? So I might need, for example, to simulate it. Um, maybe my language uh, doesn't have a, I don't know, a, a, a user interface with which I can work. So I might need to execute, or I might need to execute my language in something like this, which is a high five risk. Uh, board, right? And it, it doesn't come, 
I, well, probably, maybe it has a display after, I'm not sure. But so if you want to work with it, you have to connect through, uh, through the network, for example. And so you need to execute remotely, maybe. Or maybe you can connect there and type some commands, but it will be better if you could just use a user interface in your laptop. So there are many things, right? And what are the approaches there to improve uh, the productivity when you want to create a new computer language? Well, there are many, many approaches different. Uh, the simplest one is to just target another existing language, like it could be, for example, Java, right? You can target your own language to generate bytecodes for that, uh, for a Java VM, right? So that uh, you don't have to do a lot of work. You just generate uh, bytecodes from your language, and then you execute it on the Java VM. That's one possible approach. There are also metacompilation frameworks, which just, uh, just Joe, like uh, PyPy and um, Truffle that allows you to write an interpreter and they will optimize it to a level that will be very fast. Um, and there are also other frameworks which are called micro VMs, which basically consist of libraries that you can compile and you can link on your own computer language so that you can reuse, for example, the garbage collector, you can reuse uh, the JIT compiler or any other part. There's also the possibility of writing everything by your own, of course, which is what we did and what we don't want to do again. And there's also PowerLang, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the idea is that all of these current approaches have benefits and problems, right? If you use uh, Java VM, you are going to be limited in what the Java VM is able to do, right? You, you don't have much choice there. It's, I just generate the bytecode that exists and nothing else. If you use metacompilation frameworks, well, they are uh, pretty efficient but have other problems like um, you don't have that much flexibility in some, uh, in some areas um, because you just write the interpreter, you, you are uh, not allowed to access some parts of the, of the framework itself. Um, micro VMs were, could be too much low level. You have a lot of uh, flexibility, but they can be hard to produce. And, well, there's not a clear thing like you should use this or that one. Like everybody could use the one they need. If you want a small, very small VM, maybe you want to use a micro VM. If you want to use something that this is already installed everywhere, you use a hotspot. Anyway, so what is PowerLang? The idea of PowerLang is to, uh, to have like an ecosystem in Smalltalk, written in Smalltalk, where you can reuse any approach that is listed before in, the, in this slide, right? So what's the idea? It's to have a high level framework for doing VM programming, right? So that you can, for example, reuse maybe a debugger, uh, reuse uh, a compiler, reuse uh, an existing execution semantics that has been done uh, previously, uh, reuse the bootstrapping mechanism or any part that you want to reuse. Um, so this is, um, this is a, an idea that started like one year ago, maybe. Um, uh, we have been doing some, uh, some, at first some initial experiments, and now we, have, we are having better and better uh, things implemented. Uh, it all started with me trying to implement uh, something for uh, reusing the DMR com uh, concepts that I had already implemented in B, right? So the first thing that I worked on was uh, bootstrapping, uh, like creating a, an executable image where I could uh, put all my objects there, all my uh, executable code there, 
and to generate something from there. Then I also uh, worked on simulation and debugging of that code, right? But uh, and well, and finally um, I did some work on trying to um, define some simple execution semantics, like what we see here, for example. My idea was that I, I didn't want to have bytes as we know bytes, which are target, targeted for the for the processor as it works, like in a linear fashion, like executing one instruction at a time. But more something like what we see in the real call here. What we see is that we have a method m that self a message the message foo and returns right. So the idea is to represent instead of bytes representing the AST. Right, so we encode uh, the AST with a nest uh, with a, a group of arrays which are nested. It's, it, it's more like a tree, but encoding the AST, it has much less information than the actual AST. So, for example, this call one represents that this is a method node. The call nine means this I'm, this is what I'm going to return, and then the nested array there is that I'm going to send a message, and finally the receiver of the message is an encoding for self, right? Just some kind of idea and execution semantics, but more in a tree than in a bytecode, because this is nicer to, uh, to work. Uh, so, well, uh, it's funny that uh, actually it's not the, I am not the only one has, that has thought about this, um, and in particular, um, there is a VM, or not a VM, but more of a VM framework, which is called the OMR, Eclipse OMR, that um, is a, it's a kind of micro VM, we could call it. In the, in, the, in the taxonomy defined previously, it would fit in the micro VM, uh, in the micro VM slot. So the idea is that you can uh, the library, which is written in C++, that contains a JIT compiler, it contains a GC, and contains many other things, and you can reuse it. So what I'm going to, uh, to show now is um, actually Jan's work, Jan's brandy work, who couldn't come here this time, but uh, has uh, recorded a, a video. So. Let me let me show you. <coughs> I guess um, <coughs> Pocho already told you a little bit about uh, about uh, the power lang and power models and some idea he has about how to build runtime systems mm, for small talk, but uh, not necessarily only small talk. Um, so one day I decided to to try a little bit and build uh, a runtime for. For PowerLang, or you know, not not really for PowerLang, but using some of the ideas, using some of the tools, both of it, uh, and build a, a little runtime, uh, maybe the traditional way. So yeah, that's what I what I did, and it turned out to be uh, quite an interesting journey. So uh, let me show you let me show you the results. Uh, enough talking. We don't need that. And yeah, we need a terminal. Mm, so here we are. So first, mm, uh, let me show show you a script. This is going to be more of a command line thing because uh, well, we started from scratch and uh, no, there is no UI, not yet anyway. So here in the script, uh, you can see you know, this is standard tonal tonal script or tonal file. Uh, which define a class that is called script. Uh, it has one method, evaluate, which is uh, basically the entry point to the whole script. Mm, so this is what the, what the runtime is going to execute. Uh, uh, and continue from there. And it does nothing really special. It just makes, you know, return a result of a self-send uh, of at three to four. Uh, and then uh, here we define the add to method, which just simply, you know, 
uh, sum these two numbers or objects if you want to and return them. So the result of the script uh, should be obviously seven. So <clears throat> the next thing we we have to do is to compile the script essentially. So <clears throat> we have a little tool that takes the script and uh, combine it with a, with a kernel <clears throat> because obviously you know in the script there is no no definition of what is, what is a plus. Mm. So you need to you need a kernel uh, which contains you know the basic classes. The basic methods like integer plus and uh, and lot of others. So um, this script uh, essentially takes the whole thing and builds the essentially an image. You know, the, the, yeah, an image that contains that contains the script and the kernel classes in a binary form. So you can think of it as a as a bootstrap of of a really tiny kernel. And uh, and escape, pack it together, and make an image. Then uh, that can be then passed to the runtime, which uh, executes the image, uh, starting with the with the script evaluate method. Um, so this is what we are going to do right now. So um, uh, if we run it, um, we should get uh, seven. Well, we got it as expected. So now. It works, or at least uh, something works. Now, the interesting thing is, um, uh, beyond, <laughs> beside that, uh, you know, the result is seven. Uh, the interesting thing is this is lookup and invoke. Um, this is essentially a debug print from from the runtime. So each time there is a method that is looked up um, uh, and executed, you get this. Uh, you get this. Print. So, as you see, we executed only one method, and that's uh, interesting, isn't it? Because here we have evaluate, and then we have send send, uh, sorry, self send to add uh, three to four, and uh, in there we send the plus. So, essentially, we should uh, see. Um, like a three, three of these lines. Well, in theory, yes, but uh, we don't because the compiler that uh, takes the internal form, uh, which is not a bytecode, uh, it's kind of a tree simplified AST thing. So the, the structure is not a linear, but it's. Um, it's more like a tree. The, co the compiler that JIT compiles and produces the instructions actually inline all of these into into a single method. So it's an inlining compiler. So not only the primitive is inline, but also the plus is inline, and the add two is inlined all into the evaluate. Uh, maybe it will be interesting to show you the code. Uh, I mean the, the machine code that it generates. Uh, I kind of understand that it might be a little rough from uh, from someone who is not really, uh, you know, not really reading machine code every day. But uh, let me try. I will explain. So here we have a uh, here we have a debugging tool, and uh, <coughs> what I did, I put a, put a breakpoint into the compiler. So oh, we let the, let the runtime to compile the method. Uh, we get the pointer to the digit code, and then we expect the digit code. That's what what we are going to do. Uh, so uh, let's. Uh, okay, we got the we got the we got the you know we got the breakpoint in the in the compiler. We just finished the compilation, mm, and then we then we step. And here we see that uh, we have this. This is the code that is compiled by the JIT compiler. So let's let's see how it looks like. Uh, 
obviously we should only see you know everything in line so this is what I'm uh, what I wanted to show so let's see for disassembly okay now it's disassembling this huge method uh, but um, we want to see something else uh, and uh, well I'm just guessing the range yeah that's good. that was a good guess okay so uh, you see this is this is the cheated code we are looking at the, at the disassembly of the cheated code <clears throat> so yeah that's it uh, now uh, you probably don't recognize uh, this assembly it doesn't look like a x86 assembly because it is not uh, I decided to, you know, it, it does run on x86, but I decided to show show a Risk Five because uh, I've been playing with the Risk Five for uh, for a little while and I kind of like it. So this is essentially a Risk Five core, a Risk Five machine code uh, running on a on a High Five unleashed chip. Uh, but uh, anyway, doesn't matter. So what you see. Is uh, is the code, and if you look look carefully, then <clears throat> you will here see this. So uh, this is essentially um, <clears throat> loading a constant seven into register S one. Well, that's the, uh, that's our seven in the code. Sorry, it's, um, not number seven. This is a small integer seven, so this is a three. Sorry, I got confused. Right. Here we load we load uh, four in to register one because here we here we store it. Mm, but yeah well uh, not sure how uh, how deep I should go into the details, but this is this is quite interesting, right? Uh, there is no no like add of these two numbers. There is no send. But here we load um, a zero with fifteen, which is a small integer value of seven, and the a zero uh, on a risk five is a return register. So we don't actually perform the computation. We actually load the constant because the inline compiler. I can see. Okay, this is uh, this um, method adds two numbers, but hey, these two numbers uh, they are fixed; they are constant. So I don't really need to perform any computation. Uh, I can just you know compute it at the compile time and then just return it. The rest is just um, you know storing uh, storing the data and objects into a stack uh, and uh, performing uh, a class checks. To make sure that the self is uh, is really what it uh, what is expected to be. Now, if you look carefully, you will see that essentially the code is the f this is on the fast path. <clears throat> right? There is no no taken branch. It's just a you know a sequence of instruction without any branch. And that's because you know the compiler the JIT compiler inlined everything. Indeed, there is a much to be desired uh, still, but as a result of a um, few, few days of hacking, uh, not too bad, I would say. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. If um, you have any questions, then feel free to ask uh, Pocho or Boris. Uh, if they can't answer, then uh, feel free to write me an email or, uh, or contact me otherwise. Thank you. Uh, enjoy the conference. OK. So um, uh, we, are not, we are now going to perform a little, a little demo of the same call.
running on the real processor there, and that's... So the teacher is this Mac machine, and uh, Barcelona is uh, that um, Sci-5 Unleashed running the Sci-5 U550 ASIC. <coughs> it's quite a power, uh, it's quite a powerful machine actually. Uh, it's a four core running at uh, 1.5 gigahertz and uh, uh, with, uh, I believe, uh, eight gigs of RAM, right? Um, so it's uh, uh, around, it, it's, it's, it's not an embedded device. This is an actual desktop class machine. And uh, we're gonna SSH into it. And uh, as you can see, this is a RISC V 64 bit. And if we cut CPU info, uh, there are four actual cores. It's uh, RISC V 64i with uh, the modules to the ISA MAFDC, which is the minimum that Linux requires to run on RISC V. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to demonstrate what Jan was doing uh, in a video recording. I just want to, uh, we, we basically the purpose of demonstration is just to show you guys that we have all of this here. And if you want to actually see and, and uh, talk about any of the aspects or any, of, uh, any part of this, because all of this is obviously open source, and, and uh, if you want to, uh, have a discussion about any particular aspect of how it works. So um, here we are um, um, uh, going to power lang small talk and what I have here in this directory is essentially the, the micro module or the SLL uh, that uh, Jan was showing how he was compiling it from that small talk code. So uh, there is the actual kernel of the small talk, which is a, an AOT compiled uh, minimal set of class library. And that is uh, compiled uh, into this um, executable BAST, which stands for Buenos Aires Small Talk. This is, this is this demo. And then we are loading that. that uh, BSL or well, Buenos Aires Small Talk Library, or um, roughly, it's an SLL. Uh, we're we're taking in that SLL, and uh, there is no actual virtual machine uh, there. This this this, uh, the, the, this BASD thing is just the core of this, uh, the the core module kernel mo kernel module of uh, the class library that is compiled ahead of time into um, RISC-V native code. And uh, uh, this is uh, what Jan showed in recording. We have it uh, in actual hardware that in this conference we can play with and, and do whatever modification or discussion we want. And I'm, I'm really impressed that, that really there's, there's only one lookup, even though there are two sends. So the compiler uh, that we're having right now, it it's already does uh, adaptive optimization and inlining that Giselle was talking about, which is something that we don't really have in production in any other small talk. This is uh, something that, that uh, the strong talk was doing, and, and there are some experiments that, that uh, the, with the system format. Uh, but this works for real on uh, any processor because we're using a, a target agnostic technology here. Um, so that's the, the, this is this is a very small demo. But uh, if anybody is interested in, in actually playing with this and, and seeing the code, uh, we have it on that little machine. We are out of time now. We're out of time now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, let's make one question, if there is one question. Okay, thank you very much.